All right, welcome back everybody to another edition of Bears Guide 205. Today we are talking market areas, central place theory, and a very, very confusing uh, chart. But it's okay, we're gonna make it through. This video is gonna be a little long probably, but I'm gonna do my best to get through it as fast as possible. If you're confused on anything, pause it, go back in the video, rewatch it again. Um, that's what I gotta recommend on this one. Like I said, gonna try and keep it short. So, starting off with the question. Give an example of a service that would only exist in a major city and give an example of a service that would exist in a small town and a large city. We kind of talked about this in the previous lesson when we were talking about what would exist in Tampa and what would exist in Temple Terrace because whatever exists in Temple Terrace also exists in Tampa because small everyday services are everywhere, gas stations, McDonald's, Pizza Hut's, but larger services are going to belong in major cities, things like movie theaters or malls. And that's what we're gonna get into a little bit, starting off with central place and market areas. So this is what we're focusing on first. What is a central place? Essentially, it's like a functional region or a nodal region. Every service has a market area and that service is the central place. You'll also hear market areas called hinterlands. I don't know why they're called hinterlands. It's not what I think about when I think about services, but apparently it is so for example let's say you want to go see a movie you're not going to drive to orlando to go to a movie theater but if you wanted to go to a theme park like disney you would have to drive to orlando because every service has a functional region a nodal region or a central place in a market area and the fact is that when we get rid of bias or whatever we want to choose from everybody goes to the same uh, a certain market area and you're either in that market area or you're not in that market area right uh, for example if you are at home most people go to the same drugstore or grocery store every week your parents go to the same grocery store probably every week because they're in that market area they're in that hinterland of the central place because it just makes sense that way so what makes up a market area? What makes us decide like, yeah, this is the store or this is the movie theater we're gonna go to? Well, it's made up of two things, range and threshold. Range is the average distance people are willing to travel to that service. It's measured in time, not distance, right? And then threshold is the number of people required to financially support a business. So before we get into these things, before you say, oh no, I'm confused, I'm lost, let's picture this. So you're at your house and you can turn right on the main road and go down a mile to get to a grocery store or you can turn left and go down a mile to get to the same exact grocery store. Well, you're gonna choose one or the other and what dictates that is how much time. The one that to the right has say six lights and they always turn red. But if you go to the left, you only have to go through one light. So of course that's gonna be shorter and that's the one you're gonna go to. That's why you're in that market area. Now threshold is a little different. Threshold is basically the number of how many people it takes to keep that business open. So a smaller service like Starbucks maybe needs 100 customers a day to reach their threshold. Where a place like Publix needs a lot more customers in a day to reach its threshold to stay open. These two things determine market area and it also determines how many of that service exist in an area. So how many Publixes do you see? Obviously, fair amount, you're like, wow, that's a lot of Publixes. There couldn't be more of a different service than that, but wait, look how many Walgreens we have. So why is it that there's so many more Walgreens than there are Publixes? Well, we know Publix has a small market area, or I'm sorry, Walgreens has a small market area. A Walgreens, a drugstore, doesn't have as high as a threshold as a Publix does. So when we're thinking of these different market areas, we know that the market areas are gonna be smaller for a Walgreens, so there can be more of them. But why is it that there can be more of them? Well, let's go back to say our Starbucks example, and we know Starbucks is everywhere. But if it only takes 100 people a day to keep that Starbucks open, and say it gets to the point where they're serving two, 300, 400 people a day, they go, we need to open up another Starbucks, and they can put one a block away because they know they can still reach that same threshold at both of the Starbucks. Right, and that goes with any service. But if we had to draw market areas, we have to remember that market areas do not overlap. You're either in one market area or the other because you're gonna go to one service or this other copy of that service. 
right? So market areas of the same services cannot exist, but some market areas are bigger than others. So if you look on here, you notice that the, the Walgreens with the seven has a ginormous market area, while the Walgreens with, let's think, while the Walgreens in the red has a much smaller market area. So why is it that that giant green market area that was the seventh Walgreens is so much larger than the one in red? Well, it comes down to population. If you notice where the red one is, it's in the heart of Tampa, and there's five other Walgreens around it because there's enough people to meet that threshold. And they're not willing to drive far to get to a Walgreens. Where the one in green, there's not as many people, so they have to have all that space to fill that threshold. Now, the general rule with market areas, bigger businesses have larger ranges and higher threshold, thus they have larger market areas. Things like malls, grocery stores, airports, theme parks, people are willing to drive further to get to these things because they're so specialized, but the reason that they are they have such huge market areas is because it takes so many people to keep that business open. Whereas smaller businesses have smaller ranges and lower thresholds to make smaller market areas, coffee shops, drugstores, pizza places. Remember, this is only a general rule, right? But when you're gonna go to a McDonald's, are you gonna go to the McDonald's that's five minutes away from your house or 30 minutes away from your house? I mean, if we're eliminating bias here, everyone should choose the five minute one. But when it comes to bigger businesses, you generally have to drive, unless you live in a populated area like Tampa where we do have airports and theme parks and all that stuff relatively close by. But that's what takes us into our next theory of central place. So for example, a service with a huge market area are airports. Airports have a very large range and a very high threshold and only large cities can support them. And when we look at this map, we can see where those large cities are. So over the Midwest, where there's not a lot of lights, there's not gonna be a ton of airports, right? But where we see this accumulation of dots, that's where you find the airport. So people have to travel to that. So just a quick recap on this. All businesses are the central place of their market area. They are the node of their functional region. And the size of a market area is decided by the range and threshold of a business. So businesses that are important, that are popular, that are very specialized, are gonna have really long ranges. And businesses that need a lot of money to support themselves are gonna have very high thresholds. And remember, market areas of the same service can never overlap. You're either gonna to go to one mall or the other. You're gonna to go to one target or the other, right? We're not talking about overlap because of course market areas overlap when you're talking like a McDonald's versus Starbucks because they have all of their own unique market areas. Now, what if we took this idea of market areas of single services and applied it to entire cities? And that's what we're gonna get into when we talk about central place theory. And this is where we get Crystaller's central place theory. So this guy says, you know what? All of the services that we have all have their own market areas. But combine that all in cities and towns have their own market areas. And according to Crystaller, urban areas are arranged in a way where everyone is within the market area of a city. So let's see a, a drawing of what this theory looks like. Now, please don't be overwhelmed. It's okay. We're going to get through this. So in this model, he uses hexagons and dots to show the dot is the city and the hexagon shape is that market area of that city. The largest dot in the center are our really big cities, think Tampa, that have all levels of services. We have our essential services from gas stations all the way to our super specialized services like airports and theme parks, so on and so forth. To make it a little easier, I outlined it in color to kind of help us understand. Now there are different names for different size settlements. Remember, this is all about settlements. There's cities, there's towns, there's village, there's haulers, whatever those are. But to understand, we're gonna use A cities, B cities, and C cities. A cities have all services, from your most basic services to your most specialized services. The B cities have most of the services in the A city, but lack some specialized ones but they always have all the services in C cities. And then finally, C cities in green have the basic services to live, but no specialized services. So for example, 
if Tampa is the red dot in the center, that means all the surrounding blue cities and green cities are within Tampa's red hexagon market area. So if they ever need something, they can drive to Tampa to get it. Say you're in Plant City and you're one of those little green dots. Well, if you have to go to the airport, you're probably going to go to Tampa International Airport. Or if you want to go to a theme park, you're probably going to go to Busch Gardens, right? Or you need a specialized healthcare provider, you're probably going to go to Tampa. Now, the blue dots, I would equate those to probably St. Pete, right? So if you live in St. Pete, you can find most of the services. But some people have to drive to Tampa to get those specialized services. But before you ask, wait, around the red dot, there's the green hexagon and the blue hexagon. Well, that's the different level of services. People in Tampa have to have access to, you know, regular everyday services like schools and gas stations, grocery stores. But then also those somewhat specialized services like movie theaters and malls, which are outlined by the blue hexagon. So it is a little confusing, but we're going to dig more into this in class. So once again, to reiterate this point, what might be some services which are located in a big city but are used by everyone in the surrounding area? We would think major theme parks, major universities, sports arena, museums, airports, major hospitals, theaters, zoos, and all of these things can be located in Tampa. All of these services have an incredibly high threshold. These could not survive in a place like Plant City because there's just not enough people there, right? But then you think, wait, Tampa's not the only city in Florida that has all of these things. What is the next closest city that has major universities, theme parks, sports arenas, museums, airports, hospitals, live theaters, zoos? And we go, oh, Orlando, right? So when we think about central place theory and market areas, remember, market areas don't overlap. So you are either deciding I'm going to go to Tampa for this thing or I'm going to go to Orlando for this thing based on whose market area you're in. But what about the small towns? What services will you find there? Once again, we see everyday things, retail stores, doctors with urgent care, you know, like clinics, mechanics, parks, movie theaters, restaurants, your essential everyday services. But the people that live in these places are going to have to travel to the bigger cities to get those specialized services we mentioned earlier. So as we've mentioned, when we look at the different levels of cities, we have the green ones that have your essential services. We have the blue mid-sized urban areas where they have all the essential services from the green and they have some of the services of red. But at the end of the day, if you want to get to the really specialized services, that stuff that has a really high threshold and a really high range, you have to go to the A cities that have them. So in short, Chrysler's central place theory says that urban areas are spread out so that everyone has immediate access to essential services within their market area, and they're within a market area of larger services. So yeah, that's essentially the distribution of cities in any country, right? Now, there are some assumptions that come along with this. And in AP Human Geography, we're going to talk a lot about a, diff a lot of different theories. And theories aren't perfect. They're just theories. And there's a lot of assumptions that come with them. But that doesn't mean we can't apply them and learn from them, right? So some of the assumptions are that there are no topographic barriers. There's no mountains or rivers or forests. There's no difference in soil fertility. Population is evenly spread out. Everybody has the same purchasing power. That means everybody makes the same amount of money. People have very similar lifestyles, similar incomes, there's a uniform transportation network, and the purchase of goods and services are at the nearest center. That means we don't have bias. We go to what's the most convenient. But we know in the real world that physical barriers and resource distribution is different, and we know we have to create modifications to the space that we live in to make it happen. Some areas tend to conform, some don't, and that's okay. But the idea is that we can really lay this out and begin to understand where to place the services in the real world. Now, the, this is what the actual theory looks like, which is what I tried to outline earlier. This is just way more overwhelming 
So if this confuses you, fall back to the one that I already added color to. But the idea, idea here is that the blue dye outlined by the orange is a city. This would be where all of your services are from most essential to most centralized. Then the blue dot with like the black outline are the towns. It's at the corners of the orange market area. And then they have that dark line market area. And then you have your villages, which are on the corners of the towns that have their own little hexagon. And then the corners of their hexagon are the hamlets or very small regions with their really essential services. But we don't have to get into too much detail about it. So a couple of conclusions. The first one, towns of the same size are evenly spaced because they are in the center of liked sized market areas. Larger towns will be further apart than smaller towns because their market areas are larger. Pretty common sense there. And then distributions of cities, towns, and villages in a region is related to trade areas, population size, and distance. The fact is we're not gonna put densely populated places next to each other. So finally, what do you need to know? Yes, you've made it to the end of the video. We're finally here. You need to be able to discuss what makes market areas large or small based on range and threshold. You have to be able to explain how cities can have market areas based on central place theory. And then finally, you have to be able to discuss the assumptions and conclusions of Kristaler's central place theory. Now, I know this was a little overwhelming and I tried to go fast to keep the video down, but that probably led to some confusion. I highly recommend you going back and watching this, or if you have any questions, to write them down and ask them in class. As always, I'd appreciate if you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and hit the bell icon to know when new videos pop up. As always, this is Bear's Guide to a 5, and I'll see you next time.